Hi, I am Steve Bowen. I am a NASA astronaut, and I have been a NASA astronaut for 18 years or so. And I was invited to come answer some questions for your class, and I have the questions here available to me. And I really appreciate this opportunity to get a chance to talk to you. I need to thank Amelia uh, for convincing her father to convince me to, uh, to speak to you all today, and uh, we'll see how this works out. So first question was apparently from several people, what training did you have before you left? Well, I assume you mean left Earth. Uh, you know, my entire life I have been training for something. You know, initially you start off with your primary school time, and uh, during primary school, I, I actually wasn't a, a very good reader early on. I, when we were first starting to read uh, as a seven-year-old or so, I was, I was in the lowest reading group, and uh, the teachers in the good old days, and maybe they still do this, uh, in your school, they tell you things, like very directly. And so my teacher told me, Steve, you are in the lowest reading group. And uh, I was fairly stubborn, so I uh, didn't want to be there. And I worked real hard, and I learned how to read. So by the end of that year, I was in the highest reading group. And there were a couple of things I learned out of that was, uh, well, first of all, I really like to read. I, I read uh, pretty continuously all the time, usually have a couple books going, read several newspapers a day, uh, probably to uh, too much at times. Uh, the other thing I learned was that there's some reason these teachers are teaching you these things. They, some reason they want you to know what this information is they're trying to teach you. So for the next few years, actually pretty much continuously, every time I had a class I didn't enjoy so much or a, a something I didn't quite understand, I'd spend a little extra time working on that. And uh, I found that, hey, there's usually some good reason we're trying to learn these things. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had done very well, and I was able to choose the school I, I wanted to go to. So I chose to go to the U.S. Naval Academy. And uh, the Naval Academy was just great engineering school and uh, had some great opportunities when you graduate. I, I followed the same path. And so when I graduated from the Naval Academy, I, again, had got to choose what I wanted to do. And so I chose to join the submarine force. And I was in the submarine force for 14 years before I became an astronaut. And uh, along the way there, I, I continued to work hard and do the best I could and uh, try to understand exactly what it is they were trying to teach me because in, uh, in any job, any profession, there's continuous learning. You always have the opportunity to, to learn a little bit more, to understand a little bit better what, you're, what it is you're trying to do or uh, understand what's coming down the pipe and that you might be able to help or work on. So that's always been an exciting thing for me. But becoming an astronaut is a little bit different. Uh, I had the opportunity to apply to become an astronaut uh, in 1998 when the message came out uh, and the uh, applications were sought. And so when I applied, we had about 7,000 people apply, and they chose 17 of us in the class of 2000 to become astronauts. The most recent class, they had 18,000 applicants, and they chose 10. Uh, so that's not quite the same thing where if you do well, you get to choose what you want to do. This was uh, sort of a complete roll of the dice, a, a sort of a, um, you feel very fortunate to be selected to be an astronaut because you know there are so many people who are more qualified and probably more capable than you are that, that didn't make it and somehow you managed to squeak your way through. So along the way I've done a, a lot of training and that was even before I got to NASA. Now at NASA when you first show up you are spending two years basically uh, learning space. Uh, when I first showed up, we were flying the space shuttle, and uh, the space station was brand new. And so we, were, we learned as a class uh, space station systems and space shuttle systems. We learned a lot of how to communicate with others. We learned how to fly the T-38, fly the T-38. And uh, we did our EVA, our spacewalk training, after those first two years. Uh, over the time, as things have changed, the most current class that we chose just over a year and a half ago, they, uh, they will learn Russian as part of their initial training. They will complete their sp initial spacewalk training as part of those first two years. But it's still about two years of very uh, steady training uh, so that after two years, you're no longer, longer an astronaut candidate, but you're an astronaut, and you have the opportunity to be assigned to a fly a mission in space. So after two years, when we were done with our astronaut candidate training, uh, we were able to be assignable to a training. So for us... And uh, for an astronaut candidate, after you get done with that, you're not going to get assigned immediately, or at least most people won't get assigned immediately, because 
there's a sort of a, a pipeline, a, a se sequence of uh, opportunities that come up, and you continuously fill that with training. So I was not assigned to my first space shuttle mission for seven years after I arrived at NASA. Uh, during that time, I worked on my robotics training, I worked on my EVA training, and uh, when I did get assigned, I, get, I got assigned to a mission where I was able to do three spacewalks and uh, put that EVA training to use, and that, uh, I think, turned out really well. So you do a lot of training in a lot of areas uh, before you ever have the opportunity to arrive at NASA as an astronaut. And then as an astronaut, if you don't like going to school, you definitely have the wrong job. Uh, we get to do a lot of cool stuff, but really studying and learning is such an exciting thing for, for me, and I think probably for everybody, all the astronauts, that that's what you do. It's part of your job. Okay, so for the second question, we got a question from Class 3K from Orly. What do you do on the way to the moon, into space, and how long does it take? That's a sort of a multi-part question in a lot of ways. So there's the initial takeoff and launch when you're trying to get into orbit, when you first get to space. And pretty much any vehicle you take, I took three space shuttle rides uh, to get to space. The Soyuz takes about the same amount of time. Any of these commercial vehicles that we're looking at flying in the future is all going to be about 10 minutes. You're going to be less than 10 minutes. Our shuttle is about seven and a half, eight minutes. Uh, you will be going from zero miles an hour sitting on the launch pad to about 17,000 miles an hour orbiting the Earth. So th that's not very long. Uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into that. You're on your back for a couple hours. Uh, no matter which way you choose to go to space, you're in the vehicle for a long time before you launch into space. Now, once you're in space, then everything changes. So if we're going to the International Space Station uh, on the space shuttle, it actually took us two days to get there because we would launch into space and they'd put us in a position that we were able to assess the health of the space shuttle, make sure it was still good, and we were able to fly, fly it home. And then we would go dock to the space station. It took us about two days. Uh, currently, the Soyuz, when it launches out of Kazakhstan, they try and dock within about six hours. So that's not very long. You get to launch in space, take it 10 minutes to get to orbit, then you're floating in space, and you go to the International Space Station. And on the same day you started off getting suited up and heading into the capsule, you're on the International Space Station, and you're there for six months or so. So that doesn't take a long time to get to space. Your job in space will take a while. Now, going to the moon, uh, the way we have done that previously and basically the way we're going to continue to do that, it's going to take several days. So what you will do is you'll get that initial 10 minutes of launch into orbit. You're going to circle the Earth a couple times just to make sure that all the systems are good and everything's working. And then you're going to light the rocket engines again, and you're going to send yourself into orbit around the moon. And that distance is about 250,000 miles. And that's uh, about 1,000 times further than it is to the International Space Station. So you go from about 200, 250 miles to the International Space Station to 250,000 miles to the moon. But it only takes about three days. So you will start do that burn. And you'll be three days later, you'll be circling the moon, getting ready to land on, uh, on the moon or to go to the gateway, which will be the laboratory we have orbiting the moon. So it's a, it doesn't take that long in the big scheme of things. Now, when you get to the moon, if we go on to Mars, it'll take potentially a year to get there. So when you get to these places, you're going to make the most of your time there. So when you get to the moon or you get to... Uh, Mars, you'll spend a year or two on Mars working and learning and uh, doing research. On the moon, it'll probably be some smaller number than that, but you have to pay back the time you took to get there. So it's, uh, it depends on your admission, but getting into space really doesn't take that long. And so what you do on your way uh, to orbit is you sit there and you watch your systems, make sure everything's working correctly. Because if anything fails, you need to take some action. You want to make sure you have that ability and understanding to safely return yourself to Earth if there's a problem on your launch. So those first eight minutes, you're pretty tense. Then after that, once you get into orbit and you get to float around, it, you kind of relax a little bit. You really focus in on those opportunities, those points in time when you have to ensure everything goes correctly. So that burn uh, that gets you to docking to the station or docking the space station those periods of time, you're really very tense, and you only focus on those things. But uh, once you get to space station, you're going to be living there for six months. Or if you get to Gateway or to the moon, you can't f 
focus continuously. So you have to find ways uh, to break up the time. You'll be doing your job. You'll be doing research. You'll be working long days, uh, but you'll still have the opportunity. From Space Station, you can call home. You can watch movies. You can read books. You can take pictures. Uh, there's a lot of ways to uh, sort of fill your time. You can look out the window. It's fantastic. So that's a good way to fill your time uh, when you're in space. There's lots to do. All right, next question from uh, 3R, Nia and Miles. What does it look like inside the space shuttle? Uh, <laughs> well, the space shuttle is uh, not very big. So I, if you get the opportunity to go to the space shuttle, it's probably three, four meters wide, two meters uh, deep, and uh, three meters high, uh, two and a half meters high, actually. And seven people will be sleeping in that space. Your bathroom facility is in that same space. The galley or kitchen is in that same space. All your equipment is in that same space. The flight deck is smaller, but you only operate up there, and usually you only have four people in that space. So the combined volume of the entire livable volume of the space shuttle is actually pretty small. It's about the size of, you know, an oversized tent, a good five, seven-person tent. And you're just never going to go outside and live in it for a week or so or three days if you go to station. Uh, the space station, however, is huge. It's uh, about the size of a five-bedroom house on the inside. So there's plenty of room on the space station. What it looks like on the inside of both these vehicles is very um, utility-driven, very industrial. It's got cables and wires and uh, hoses and fans and there's a lot going on because you don't want to waste any of your space uh, that you have, that precious little volume. Uh, you want to make sure you get the most out of it. So they don't put a lot of thought into the uh, appearance, into the aesthetics, into making it look real pretty uh, when, you get, when you get on board. So it's, it's pretty, uh, I think grim was the word somebody used the other day when I took them through. Uh, they also couldn't imagine seven people sleeping in that same space. But it's like camping. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, especially if you're doing something you feel is important. Okay, now a question from 3M, from the whole class. Why did you become an astronaut, and what does the training involve? All right, I may touch a little bit more on training. I just did that. Uh, but why did I personally become an astronaut? So when I was uh, your age, actually, yeah, I guess I was your age, we were flying the Skylab missions uh, here in the United States, and we had gone to the moon on the Apollo missions, and I, as a small child, uh, had seen man walk on the moon from my uh, living room. We had a black and white TV back then, and uh, it was really exciting. Got to stay up late, and we were all making jokes about, you know, maybe it's green cheese or maybe they're going to sink into the silt or something. But uh, I guess I'd seen a lot of science fiction cartoons and movies. But, you know, those Apollo-era flights, the Skylab missions, uh, Apollo-Soyuz mission, it was news. It was part of sort of what we the life we were living you kind of knew about these things going on and I found it really exciting I really uh, enjoyed uh, mathematics and science and engineering and this was all of that brought to life in a in on a fairly regular basis you know when we started flying space shuttles in the early 80s it was still incredibly exciting but it kind of drifted off the front page of the newspapers and I don't think a lot of people thought about it as much but it really as a young child uh, it really put the bug in me about science and engineering. And so when I graduated from high school, I knew I wanted to become an engineer. I went to the Naval Academy, and I studied electrical engineering, and I, I really enjoyed it. I got the opportunity to work on a nuclear power submarine for a number of years, and it's just amazing. You know, it is big engineering. It's real uh, tough technical mechanics. Things work. Uh, you electricity flows, you make your own electricity, you make your own water. It's just an incredibly exciting environment, and uh, it still really excited me. So when the opportunity applied to become an astronaut, I never, ever thought I'd be selected to be an astronaut. It, it seemed like a, a, a guess, you know, a, a gamble. It wasn't even a gamble. I mean, I was just going to put my a application in and, and uh, see where it took me or if I had that opportunity, and I got incredibly fortunate to be able to come down for an interview, and I thought that was it. Uh, and uh, I had looked uh, when I applied because I had not been, you know, 
looking and focusing on space. I'd been focusing on, you know, driving submarines for a living. And I saw that they were building an international space station. I knew that this thing kind of existed. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that that is just a remarkable accomplishment for mankind. Just the opportunity to have an international vehicle uh, built by so many countries working together in space, doing real science on this giant engineering platform. And I, I still think it's probably the, the ultimate technical creation for mankind. And I just found it incredibly exciting. So just having the opportunity to be a part of that uh, really, I think, excited me and, and helped me step up to apply. And uh, I haven't regretted that ever since. All right, I think I covered the training earlier. 4W, Neil, how do you get a water supply on a spaceship? This is a great question because we don't have a water supply on the spaceship. We did on the space shuttle. The space shuttle used to make water. So talking about engineering like I just did, if you take hydrogen and oxygen and you combine them together, uh, you get water and an electron out. The main engines on the space shuttle used hydrogen and oxygen to uh, send it into space. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty volatile reaction when it's not controlled. But when you do control it, you make electricity and your byproduct is water. So the space shuttle used to make so much water that when we got to space station, we would just leave it. Space station runs on solar power. It has big solar uh, arrays that rotate uh, as we circle the Earth every 90 minutes. They, do they go one full circle, but they don't make any, any water. So we left all this water from space shuttles through the years on board space station. When it became time to retire the space shuttle, we uh, had to determine how we would maintain water, because you need water to survive. And so they came up with this process, the water recovery system, which allows them to recycle all the sweat, condensate, and urine uh, on board station, and we make, we regenerate water. Uh, we make clean water out of not clean water. And it does it in a very efficient and very rapid manner so that we recover about 80% of all the water we have on station as we cycle through it, which is pretty remarkable. And it has allowed us to not uh, fly lots and lots of water, because flying water is flying weight. And every time you fly water, you're not flying something else. And we really want to uh, maximize the opportunity for science on board space station. So fly not flying water frees up science. And so that's what we do. That's where our water comes from. We, uh, we recycle what we have. And uh, looking forward to the future, you know, fuel cells, if that's how we choose to do it, that might be a source of water. But recycling is really how we're going to keep our water supply in orbit. All right. For Delta, Curtis, how cold or hot is it when you are out in space? So when you are outside in space, uh, you're in a vacuum. And it's, uh, it's neither hot nor cold, in a sense. If the sun is out and uh, the surface of something, it's probably about plus 200 degrees Celsius. Celsius. If the sun has set, in other words, you're on the dark si backside of the earth away from the sun, which happens every 90 minutes, you spend half the night, half the time dark and half the time in light, uh, it's about minus 200 degrees Celsius. So it's, it goes from incredibly hot to incredibly cold uh, in a very short period of time in space. But, you know, temperature, what you're really measuring there is atoms flowing around. And uh, when they're flowing fast, and you know, a lot of them you're going to end up with hot and the, when they slow down and they're not going very fast, it gets really cold. So uh, for us in the spacesuits, when we go out and do spacewalks, what I do is I usually set my cooling, and we have the ability to adjust our cooling uh, to a very certain level that I, I know I'll be comfortable at. And then I just work to, at a pace that allows me to stay comfortable with that setting. And so it's, I tell people it's like working in my pajamas when I get the temperature right uh, in my spacesuit when I go outside. On, inside the space station, the temperature of the space station within parameters for the systems on board uh, is basically controlled by the commander of the space station. And so usually it's pretty comfortable. Uh, I spend a lot of time in shorts and a t-shirt on board space station, so I found it very comfortable. Uh, some people like it a little colder, some people like it a little warmer. Uh, if I get the opportunity to go back, I'll 
you know, I'll make my adjustments to whatever, at whatever temperature they have it set on the inside. All right, 4S, Talia. How do you get back to the same place on Earth? So, when you are coming back from space, you don't just fall from space. You know, you're circling the Earth, you're falling past the Earth. Uh, every 90 minutes, you're going around the Earth. And you get to choose the point at which you decelerate, at which point you do your re-entry burn, which point, you know, you're slowing down the vehicle from that 17,500 miles an hour. You only take a little bit of, of speed out of that, and you start to fall into the Earth's atmosphere. And as the Earth's atmosphere gets thicker and thicker as you get closer to the Earth, you'll slow down more and more and more and more, and that will bring you down in the Earth. So the key is, you pick that spot uh, where you do your deceleration in space so that you will land at the right spot on Earth. Now that's really, it sounds pretty simple in a lot of ways because I'm just picking one point so I can land at another point and you're just gonna land like that. Uh, but that means that you understand the atmosphere and how thick it is and how much you're gonna slow down as you come into, uh, into landing. And uh, it's, it's a simple concept in a lot of ways, but it's actually very difficult uh, to model. And under our understanding of the Earth and its atmospheres and the physics of spaceflight uh, has made it better and better in our ability to land on the runway for the space shuttle has always been uh, pretty amazing and also very, very good. All right, so for L, Alfie, how does it feel to look back at the Earth from space? It is absolutely amazing. It is, uh, you know, life-changing in a lot of ways uh, to realize that uh, you're in space. You're, uh, you know, I grew up in a family where uh, carrying buckets of cement was sort of what I grew up doing and laying tile. And uh, to have the opportunity to think that this is even possible, that I'd be able to go to space and, well, I guess I go to space and I do construction work. So. It's uh, not that much different in some ways, but it is in many other ways. It's just in the most amazing view, and I hope, I hope every one of you have the opportunity to see it someday. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing to look down and realize that there's, you know, 7 billion people or so living down there, and uh, it's, it's incredible. It's, the Earth is amazingly beautiful from space. All right. Marlene and 5H, have you ever been in any danger in space, and if so, what happened? So being in space by its very nature is probably considered dangerous. Uh, you know, I, I get this sort of question of uh, were you afraid or, uh, and you know, are you, scare, are, are you scared of anything in particular? And in reality, what you've done, uh, and this is part of why we train so much, you have to understand the circumstance, what you're getting yourself into. Uh, we have all accepted the risk before we ever step on that vehicle. We've accepted the risk and understand the probability and the possibility that uh, things may go wrong. So uh, that understanding that when you're sitting on the launch pad and you're thinking uh, about your mission, you're less afraid of the vehicle uh, than you are of yourself. You are sitting there thinking they have invested so much time and money and so many people have poured so much training into you. Are you able, are you capable of actually executing and doing what they've asked you to do? Uh, that is really what I was afraid of is, uh, you know, I had all, these tra all this training and am I actually gonna be capable of doing what they've asked? And that's really important. Uh, as far as, you know, if you look specifically at any mission, any space station mission, any any flight, uh, there's always been something that's not gone perfectly well. And uh, so many times, so many things, they, they could have gotten worse, they could have become even more dangerous, but because of our training, because of how amazing the team is on the ground that's uh, running the vehicle and supporting you, uh, we, don't get a, we don't really let it get that far to where it's a, a, a hazard that you're facing immediately. Uh, there have been some, uh, but none on any of my missions. Okay, 5S from the whole class. How are astronauts able to go to the toilet when up in space? They have specially designed toilets in space, 
And you can go online, and I think there's probably some good uh, examples and explanations of how they work. But yeah, it's one of those basic functions of living. And so yes, there is a, uh, a way that we do that, and I don't need to bore you with details. All right, so 5P for Kara. How many Earth-like planets are there in the universe that you know of? That I know of is only a few. Uh, but I don't know any more than anybody else because I read the, you know, the press and, the, and I read the discoveries that are going. When I was your age, that we had never identified another planet anywhere else in the solar system beyond the ones in ours. You know, any, any, anything beyond our solar system, we had no idea there were other planets out there. You know, we're, I think we're at about, about one a week, if not more, that people are discovering new planets in the universe. And every so often they find one that's in what they call the Goldilocks zone. And that's a planet that's the right distance from the sun, that consists of the right amount of rock, uh, that it might, might be similar to Earth. Uh, we don't know, you know, our assumption from our example of one, us, uh, we know that life can survive on Earth. We're not sure about anybody else or any place else yet, uh, but with the size of the universe and the rate of discovery of other planets, uh, there's probably some out there, and that's just assuming that you can only survive on a place like Earth. Uh, there may be other forms of life out there and other more, uh, uh, what we would consider inhospitable or unlikely places. So it, it's pretty amazing, and uh, it's absolutely incredible that our understanding of our place in the universe uh, is expanding so rapidly. All right, 5G from the whole class. What do you miss most about Earth when you are in space? And what do you miss most about space when you are on Earth? So what I miss most about space when I'm on Earth is floating. Floating never gets old. It feels really good. Um, I average about an hour more sleep in space than I do on Earth. And I think it has to do with just floating. It just feels fantastic. Uh, the view, the view is absolutely remarkable. But you can't look out the window all the time. You have to do work. Uh, but mostly what I miss about Earth when I'm in space is my family uh, here. You know, I, I miss uh, Earth. It's just, uh, you don't have to leave Earth to appreciate Earth, uh, but it, it's, uh, it does give you a little different sense of it. So, What are the sleeping arrangements like in space from Sanavi and Ishita in 6T? So, in space, on the space shuttle, we slept in uh, sleeping bags that we hung on the wall. Uh, so, like I said, there were seven of us living in a small, uh, essentially the size of a small five-person tent or so. Uh, and so I had, uh, say, Don Pettit was next to me, I had Fergie in front of me, we had Shane and Heidi like this on one wall, Sandy was in the overhead, Eric, and it was just sort of all over the place, but you were basically camping. And uh, on the space station, we have uh, sleeping quarters for the crew. We have four of them on the U.S. segment and two of them on the Russian segment. And they are basically uh, private little rooms about the size of a phone booth, if anybody knows what a so phone booth is anymore. Uh, your teacher might be able to explain to you what that really is. But that's your own private little space. You can shut the door. Uh, you can uh, turn on your computer, computer and have a do a little bit of work, you can read a book, you can sleep there. It is your own private little space. Again, you're hanging on a wall uh, in a sleeping bag potentially, uh, but at least you have a little small volume that you can call your own. And that for six months at a time, it's important to have a little bit of space of your own. Okay, for Dylan Phelps in 6H, what do you eat and drink when in space? How do you overcome this difficulty? So. The food in space is actually pretty good. Uh, each of the countries that participates on the International Space Station, uh, they kind of generate their own food, which is uh, pretty exciting. So on the U.S. side, it's similar to camping food, you know, meals ready to eat or uh, uh, comes in little pouches. You can add water to rehydrate it. You can, uh, sometimes you can just open it up if it's like nuts or something you can just eat. Uh, there's a... Uh, Vegetables that are dehydrated, you just add hot water and heat them up a little bit. So you can heat things, you add water to things, uh, some things you can just eat, you don't have, you run out of fresh fruit pretty quick. 
uh, they do send up some fresh fruit with resupply vehicles, and that's how the food gets there. It gets up there on resupply vehicles. And uh, so they will send up a container of food, and uh, that food will last a certain number of months, and the Russian segment, the Russian uh, crews will have food sent up for them. We eat some of their food. They eat some of our food. Uh, when there's a Japanese astronaut on board, usually JAXA will send up uh, some Japanese food prepared in the same way, and uh, the food from there I've eaten has been very good. Uh, European Space Agency does the same for their crew members. So the food in space is actually uh, pretty good. And occasionally you do get what they call bonus food or bonus packages, uh, where sometimes people will be able to send you up, as long as it meets the right criteria, they'll be able to send you up uh, some food of your own choosing, which is, uh, well, you get to choose, but I mean like stuff that you can go buy in the grocery store. Uh, that, that will show up as well. And we do get to choose our menu, so uh, you got to be careful about that because when you get to space, your taste buds will change. Your fluid shifts, and uh, things don't always taste the same as they did on Earth. So something you may have loved sitting in a classroom on Earth doing your food tasting may not taste quite as good in space. And so you got to keep that in mind and make sure you get a wide variety of what you want to eat in space. And drinking, I just talked about water. We recycle water, like I said, 80% of it. Uh, we do have uh, coffee. You can make coffee. You can make tea. Uh, there are fruit juices that you make, but it's all concentrate in you know powder form or tea in a tea bag. Uh, but that's that's what you drink. And I drink a lot of water. Okay, so from several children in 6R, has anything gone majorly wrong in one of your missions? What did you do to overcome it? Majorly wrong, fortunately, no. Uh, at least nothing we considered majorly wrong. Uh, we've had a, a few things, like we had a the robotic arm on the space shuttle on my uh, second mission, uh, got the camera got tangled up. So on our second spacewalk, our second EVA, I went out. I just untangled it, put a zip tie in place, and that allowed us to complete the uh, mission and the inspections that we needed to use that arm for. Uh, for the rest of the mission. Uh, we've had, you know, glitches on the systems on board, the air conditioning system on board. My last flight uh, wasn't always perfect. It kind of burped water once in a while. And you just clean it up and you deal with it. We had carbon dioxide problems, uh, you know, little things like that. But like I said, you, whenever you, you try and be as precise as, follow, as possible following the procedures, the testing of the vehicle is really, really well done so that it it should work, and uh, when things don't work, uh, we try and design the system and the procedures to ensure that you have the ability to overcome any potential issues. And like I said, your training is so good, your understanding of the vehicle is uh, so good that you you understand what you're doing. So the definition of what a majorly wrong uh, problem is, uh, it's, it's hard to define in a, in a lot of ways. Okay. From Zadie in 6C, do you for, prefer being in space or on Earth? I like being on Earth. I like being with my family. I really like being with my friends, and uh, it is just the most incredible place to be. Uh, now, Earth is, Earth is where I, I'll spend most of my remaining days, I am sure of it. Uh, space is a great place to be. If I could bring everybody to space with me, space would be a great place to retire. Uh, you kind of just float there. It doesn't lot of, a whole lot of not a whole lot of wear and tear as you're floating in space. Uh, after a while, you probably wouldn't be able to come back to Earth though, because you wouldn't have that much strength left. Uh, but now Earth is uh, Earth is definitely the place I prefer to be. Uh, but space space is where uh, we're learning uh, more about how to live better here on Earth. That's why the International Space Station exists. That's one of the major reasons we explore uh, space is to better understand how and why we are here on Earth, how we are able to make our lives better here on Earth. Uh, the basic science, our understanding of the universe is increasing every single day uh, while we're doing science and research in space. The, the systems that we develop to operate in space, I mentioned the water system earlier, you know, our ability to recycle dirty water and turn it into clean water in a very efficient and rapid manner you know, that technology has made life better here on Earth uh, for people as we develop portable, lightweight recy water recycling and recovery systems that uh, that will operate anywhere on Earth. It's just an amazing uh, technology where 
we never, ever would have had that technology because nobody would have asked the question, what do we do if we don't fly shuttles and we don't have water and space station? You know, it's, it's when you challenge yourself with new questions and new ideas and you uh, explore, it's not just the, the cause of exploration and what you learn at the end of it uh, that is important. It's also the processes and what you learn along the way that really make life better here on Earth. Uh, everything, if you look at the Apollo missions and what we did just going to the moon, uh, the technologies, the little technologies that probably seem like no big deal, our ability to communicate worldwide, uh, cordless drills, uh, you know, little things that seem simple and easy now, somebody had to ask that question the first time around. International Space Station, you know, on a bigger view, uh, we built pieces of the International Space Station all around the world. And often they never met on Earth. You never tested to make sure they would fit on Earth before we put them in space. And they all fit together and they all worked. And that is absolutely incredible. And that goes to somebody had to sort out, how in the world are we going to make this stuff work? And so going forward and exploring, you know, it, it, you've got your goal, but it's every question you ask along the way, every problem you solve along the way really contributes to our understanding and our betterment of life on Earth. So I think that's the last question. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, Amelia, I'll see you this summer probably. And uh, thank you for everything.